How many of you all have been at a sporting event, a football game, baseball game, or something with a large stadium, and there's that one character that has the big rainbow wig, and they're holding up the sign that says John 3.16? You ever seen that? Right? Yeah. I always thought that was an amazing way to evangelize the church, right? <laughs> because, I mean, we all know this scripture is probably the most memorized scripture besides Jesus wept. That John 3.16, you all can probably even say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Right. So on its face value, though, it kind of sounds like if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to perish. And that if I do believe in Jesus, I'm going to get eternal life. So that sounds like it's up to me whether I perish or have eternal life. And that's not a very Lutheran way to look at it. So let's take a look at this scripture, because if we just take it at its face value, set apart by the fellow with the fuzzy hair, you know, at a football game, it means something, yes. But let's look at it from its context. Does anybody know who Jesus... You can't answer this time. Okay. Does anybody know who Jesus is talking to when he says John three sixteen? Does anybody know? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. You guys were at first service. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And you listen. That's even better. That's good. Yes. So Nicodemus, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law. He knows all of these wonderful things about scripture. He knows what they're supposed to be doing in the church. But he's going to find Jesus at night because he doesn't want anybody to see him. He's like tiptoeing. He's like, shh, Jesus, don't tell anybody, but I need to talk to you. And they start having a conversation back and forth. And Jesus starts talking about being born anew or born again. And of course, Nicodemus, this is just like, what, do you, what does this even mean? And then they start wrestling around with some words. And Jesus looks at them and says, if you can't understand earthly things, how are you going to understand heavenly things? And I'm just going to read the last little part before we get to our lesson today. No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And then it goes into our gospel today where he says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then it's John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I got to tell you, the first time I read this, uh, you know, when I put it all together in, in its order, I'm like, what is he talking about, Moses and the serpent, and then all of a sudden, for God so loved the world? I, I, I wanted to look further into it, and then I, I, we were blessed that today's Old Testament lesson happened to be and from Numbers, where Moses is lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. Did you hear that part? It's a great lesson. Um, so Numbers is this great book in the Bible, part of the Torah, and it's part of the first five books of the Bible. And a lot of people consider it named Numbers because at the beginning and at the end, they take a census. So it deals with numbers of people. But really in the Hebrew, it's, it means something more like wilderness journey, or one scholar says a travel log, because it tells about the time that the Israelites are in the wilderness. And it has three parts to it where they're stopping along the way and these little interludes between each part. And the snake story that we have today comes at the last interlude. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Because it starts off with the Israelites out of Egypt with Moses. Now what do we do? And they're out at Mount Sinai. And what do the people receive at Mount Sinai? Anybody? The Ten Commandments, that's right. I like that y'all say that with a little bit of a question mark on it. That's good. It's all right. Yes, they received the Ten Commandments. And we've learned from Pastor Heather a couple weeks ago that the Ten Commandments are about relationship. The first three are about our relationship with God or God's relationship with us. And the last seven are about our relationships with each other. And God's saying, hey, I'm making a covenant with you. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. Let's get some ground rules laid out here. Because this covenant is off of the Abraham covenant, that I am your God and you are my people, which is off of the Noah covenant, but I'm never going to destroy this world, which is off of the covenant of paradise, wanting to be in a relationship with humanity. And so now God's trying to establish some ground rules. And at first, it seems like the Israelites are like, this sounds pretty cool. And they're doing everything they're supposed to do, following the letter of the law. They're lining up everybody. They're getting ready to start marching. And it's supposed to be about a 14-day journey to get to the promised land. But we all know that it took them 40 years. What happened? I'm glad you asked. So they start to go along their way. And as they're marching, 
people are getting kind of tired and they're getting hungry and they start grumbling and they start complaining. And they're like, you know what? It'd be better if we just went back to Egypt and die there than die out here in the wilderness. Why did you bring us out here anyway? There's nothing to eat. And so God provides them food. And what food does God provide? Anybody remember? Manna. It sends manna for manna. There's also quail at one point in time. Yes. Poultry and bread. Fancy. So they have this food and then they start marching and they start grumbling. Oh, it's so terrible out here. Why did we come out here? We're going to die on the wilderness. We should go back to Egypt. I'd rather die there. We're so thirsty. And then God provides water from a rock. And the cool thing, if you read it, that rock follows them along the way. I don't know how, but that sounds really fun, right? So the whole way they're traveling, they're constantly grumbling and complaining and saying, why have you sent us out here into this wilderness? Let us go back into Egypt. We'd rather die there than die out here in the wilderness. And they keep complaining and they keep grumbling. And it gets so much so that God finally looks at them and they say, you're never going to make it to the promised land, but your children will. And then they get to the second stopping point And they're trying to figure out which way to go. So Moses sends out 12 spies from each of the tribes. And 10 of them end up coming back to try to find a place to go. And they all come back saying, we're doomed, man. There's nothing out there. We're going to die. And two come back and they say, we found some neat stuff. You want to check out this area? But everybody's already up in arms. They're like, oh, we're going to die out here in the wilderness. Why did you forsake us? And then Moses' brother and sister start turning against him. They're starting to want to get new leadership. What are they supposed to do? And they start marching on further. And at this point in time, Moses now is asked to get more water from that rock. And he strikes the rock. But he looks at the people and he says, look what I'm doing for you. And God looks at Moses and says, you're not going to make it into the promised land either, but your descendants will because you're rebelling against God. So these people are complaining and they're grumbling, and that's when we get to today's lesson from Numbers with the snakes. Why did you send us out into this world and it would be better for us to go back to Egypt and die? We detest this miserable food. And then God sends serpents that start to bite them and they start to die. And then all of a sudden they're like, Moses, talk to God. Tell him we're sorry. You know, do something about all these snakes out here. And so Moses prays, please forgive us. We've forsaken you. We have have turned away from you. Help us. And God says, "Build build a bronze pole, put a snake on top of it, and have the people look at it, and they'll live. And so Moses builds this bronze staff, and the people that look on it live. A lot of people that think about the Old Testament think that God is a vengeful, wrath-filled God, doesn't love, there's no grace. It's it's like this this mean, mean person with like a a, a, um, a magnifying glass and an anthill type of mentality when it comes to God. But the truth of the matter is, God has been trying to be in relationship with people since the beginning of time, making promise after promise after promise with them, trying to create a covenant with them. And in fact, when you think about the book of Numbers, every time they turned away, he gave them food. They turned away, he gave them water. They turned away, he's now giving them life. Turn to me and live. Return to the Lord. Now, many, many prophets and even the psalmist and and even the apostles in the New Testament, they write using this same uh, understanding from, from Numbers about returning to the Lord, about how stiff-necked the people were and that they just wanted to go back to the old ways and they didn't want to turn toward God and trust that God had their best intention, that God wants to be in a relationship and wants them to be their people and wants to send them to the promised land, wants to restore paradise. They don't believe all that. So all these biblical witnesses are writing about this stuff, and including Jesus, who looks at a Pharisee, one of the top Pharisees, and says, just like Moses lifted that staff... With the snake on it, so must the son of so much so must the son of man be lifted up as well. And Nicodemus would have known this storyline. Nicodemus would have been aware of the history of the book of Numbers and known he's asking me to return to the Lord, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in what? Steadfast love. So much love, for God so loved the world that he would send his only begotten son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And then the next line, John 3, 17 says, God did not send the son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. And in fact, he goes on to say that those that believe are not condemned, but those that don't believe, they're condemned already. 
They're already miserable. They're wanting to return back to the old ways. I can relate to that. I absolutely can relate to that. Because sometimes it's better to go back to the old ways of thinking and doing things because trying something new is never easy. And trusting something that I can't see or know what's going to happen, that's hard to do. It's much easier to say, you know what? It was miserable in Egypt. I was enslaved, but at least I know what's going to happen. Because if I stand over here and I start to return to God and I start trusting in this word of God and I start doing what God's asking of me, I might start treating people different. I might start seeing them as a child of God, and I don't know if I'm ready to do that just yet with everyone. I might start talking sweet and kind to people and treating them with respect. I might drive different. I might shop different. I might relate to my family different, and I don't know if I'm ready for that because the old way has a little bit of comfort where at least I know I can stand up and say, I'm right. Return to the Lord who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and only wants to be in a relationship with us. That's hard for us to do. That's really difficult for us to do. The Israelites wrestled with it. We're wrestling with it. But today's a great opportunity for us to try it. And I don't know about you, but to me, John 3.16 is a little bit deeper than just a wig and a sign. Amen.